I am Mohamed Bentires Alj. I'm a professor at the University of Basel. The goal of our research is to understand breast biology and breast cancer and to use this knowledge to improve therapy for our patients in Basel and throughout the world. My lab focuses on the cell autonomous and non-cell autonomous mechanisms regulating normal and neoplastic breast stem cells, resistance to therapy and metastasis. In collaboration with clinicians from the University Hospital of Basel, we are developing a breast cancer personalized medicine program. I'm pleased to welcome you to conversations with key figures in mammary gland biology and breast cancer. Yes, and I'm uh, Nancy Heinz, and I'm, I'm also a group leader at the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel, and my lab works on, on breast cancer and does some work on normal, normal development as well. So, so we have a lot of overlapping interests. <laughs> okay. So we are in uh, Vegas in Switzerland, and uh, Mark Twain said of this place, a Sunday morning in heaven <laughs> is noisy compared to the quietness of this place. <laughs> yeah. So we are here for the ENBDC meeting, the meeting of the European Network for Breast Development and Cancer. So you are chair this year, Nancy. Can you tell us what's particular about this meeting? Yeah, so this is a really a special meeting for young people. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, the maybe the major certainly the majority, maybe 90% are either students or PhDs. Sometimes it's the first time they can present a, a poster to an international audience. And so for them, it's very exciting to, to have then, uh, well, they get information on, uh, on uh, not only the technology, the techniques that are always discussed here, but also they get some feedback on what they're working on in the f as their first project, usually as a yeah. PhD student. So that makes it very exciting, just having so many young people around, I think. And, and one could think of it almost as a Gordon conference, slightly, I mean, maybe a third the size, and probably more uh, PhD students here than at a Gordon conference. Mm. So it's really exciting for them. That's special. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy, we first met at Mammary Gland Biology Gordon Conference and you've been a big supporter of this conference that you probably chaired once. What is particular about this meeting? About the Gordon Conference? Yeah, well this is a, it's a slightly larger version than the EMBDC meeting, the, the meeting that we're participating in today. And um, it's special in that, that it does have an emphasis on young, young people, the young people, I would say there's probably more postdocs and, and uh, then some PhD students get to come. And uh, where I, I always tell my students, so don't be afraid to go and sit at a table with somebody who you might call a big shot, because they're they are just normal people and they want to talk to you, they want to talk to you, they're interested in science. So don't, don't go off and only spend all your time with the other students, but uh, this is your chance to talk to famous uh, scientists. Nancy, yeah. before, uh, <laughs> before talking about your uh, scientific career, as an independent uh, investigator. Can you tell us a bit about your personal history, birthplace and childhood? Yeah, so I was born in Hagerstown, Maryland, which is close to Washington, DC. Um, I uh, was educated then partly in Pennsylvania and we moved to Syracuse, New York, and I did my high school degree uh, education in Syracuse. I would say I had a fairly normal childhood, pretty normal. Uh, maybe what was special about it was that I was educated by uh, nuns and, and, and uh, priests my, my, entire, my entire life. So I even did my first degree at, the, at a, a Catholic college. Mm. Um, so that maybe is a bit special. Um, I think that, that maybe that ingrained some type of uh, this of a type of work ethic that we have uh, that we had ingrained into us when we were growing up in the in the in the fifties and the sixties. So the, they expected uh, the the nuns and the priests expected a lot of good things out of their students, and uh, we learned how to work and and t actually to behave. Uh, we had to behave pretty properly too because the classes were big. I remember my first grade class, there were, I think, 60 students in it, which is a lot for a, <laughs> a big nun, <laughs> one nun to handle. And um, so, I, and I would say I, I was probably always interested in science. So what made you go into science yeah. and not art or, right. or sport? If I, if I recall well, you are somehow 
related to the great Thomas Edison. <laughs> is this where your interest in science came from? So this is a little bit, a little bit off because it's my grandfather on my mother's side worked for Thomas Edison okay. in New Jersey. So uh, my parents were, uh, grew up on the East Coast, so my father was actually born first generation from Ireland, so born mm -hmm. in, 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 in uh, New York City. And my mother's father worked for Thomas Edison. Okay. That's the connection. And I think uh, my interest in science, it must have started pretty early, because I remember when I was in first grade asking the first grade teacher, who was a nun, mm -hmm. she was talking about Adam and Eve, okay. and I asked her, so where were the dinosaurs? Were they also <laughs> <laughs> were they in the Garden of Eden as well? And I don't remember her answer, <laughs> but I remember this question, <laughs> probably not getting a satisfactory answer <laughs> about dinosaurs. <laughs> So that's where your interest uh, in and science. So my, I, so I, I was always very curious, and and mm -hmm. um, I did enjoy science in high school. So I, I liked biology. I had a nice chemistry teacher. So in the end, I, I decided to study chemistry as my first degree. So mm -hmm. I did a bachelor in, yeah, in, so in sciences and chemistry. So you obtained a <coughs> bachelor in chemistry at Saint at Saint, Saint Francis, Francis College, College in, in uh, it's near Pittsburgh, so okay, it's in Pennsylvania. Yes, and this and was run by the n the priests, okay. <laughs> the Franciscan priests. But then in 1975, <laughs> you obtained a PhD in biochemistry in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah, and can you tell us about your first years in research and what was your PhD thesis about? So my thesis was. Um, so th this was the early days of mo molecular biology, mm. and it uh, was also very early days of yeah, being able to study so nucleic acids in cells. So my thesis was about, um, we were looking, so I even, ha I happened to look it up because I was prepared. Oh, that's so this, <laughs> this is my first paper, I don't think you can read the title, but it's from, uh, it's from the uh, Journal of Bacteriology, mm -hmm. which was actually a an American Society for Microbiology. We were German. using yeast as a we model. Were yes, and so it was about turnover of poly A containing RNA in, in Saccharomyces, so in yeast. And the history behind that is that I had a very young boss who was, um, had, must have done his PhD and in, in, in postdoc in the RNA field. And when he got a, uh, recruited to Pittsburgh, and this was where Mary Edmonds was working, mm -hmm. and Mary Ed Edmonds actually discovered poly A containing RNA. So discovered this um, um, uh, extension of yes, RNA with the absolutely. poly A on it, and and so we, since people didn't know what that was good for in the, those days, uh, we decided to see whether it had anything to do with the stability of the RNA. And this is what I could you show in that paper. In the early time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there we had to. Well, those days we made our own oligo DT. Everything was scratch. <laughs> pretty, pretty. No kits for anything. But this was but not the topic of your. Uh, for my thesis, this was, your PhD yeah, 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 this was my PhD thesis. Okay, that I was, was the well, I mean, we'd, I had a couple more papers, but uh -huh. we were looking at the at RNA turnover mm -hmm. and uh, and um, stability turnover in, in yeast. So after the the PhD, you did two postdocs, one at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, in Germany, and the second one at the Swiss Cancer Institute in Lausanne. Can you tell us more about the state of cancer research at that time and about what you did as postdoc? Yeah, well, we went, when we went to Berlin, um, we were recruited by um, uh, Gunther Schutz, and he, he was working in New York at that time. And he was interested in, actually, we weren't working on cancer research, we were working on um, steroid hormones. Mm -hmm. And he was interested in how stero steroid hormones control the differentiation of cells. So, uh, what, how, how do these hormones control cellular differentiation? And um, there, were, there weren't very many model systems that were. <laughs> that's not the cow, that's the <laughs> this boat. This is a boat that maybe you're going <laughs> to see behind us, yeah. And so he, he was working on the chicken oviduct. And our, um, when, we, when we started working there, we were looking at isolating RNA. Again, it was RNA, isolating RNA and looking at, at turnover, at, at, at um, the number of molecules in, in the cell the, and how they were the, a particular oviduct um, egg white protein um, um, uh, RNAs and how they were controlled by steroid hormones. So basically you moved with him from New York. Yeah, we, well, we met him when he came to Europe. We met him when we were in Pittsburgh, we met him And in then New he York. moved. Yeah. And he recruited us to... So to you were uh, among his first postdocs? Yes, we were his first postdocs. Actually Europe. we were, yeah, we okay. were his first postdocs, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we, as, as I've said, we, th so we were interested in steroid hormones and we, yeah. we worked with Gunther for um, a few years. And then we discovered this uh, famous mouse mammary tumor virus, that that was a, 
a steroid hormone inducible system and um, and in this case it was was a small genome so only 10 kb and it was known that the that the long terminal repeats would have to would be responsive okay, yeah, to a steroid it. hormone so in a way the system was easier than um, the chicken oviduct mm. because you had every everything that you needed was in this LTR and so we decided very naively we said oh well we'll start working on mouse memory tumor virus and 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 we went. We asked Heidi Diggleman in, in Lausanne if she would be willing to hire us, and she and she was, and she was working on um, retrovirus, chicken retroviruses. And at those days, I thought every retrovirus was the same, mm -hmm. and I had no idea that mouse memory sure. tumor virus was a lot harder to sure, work on than. Right. I mean, we had to set up the system ourselves there in, in Lausanne. But she was very uh, open and willing to having these two postdocs come in and. So see you what always they could do. said we. Ah, yes. So my we is my husband, Bernd Groener. So we met in graduate school, and then we were together in, in Berlin as postdocs, and then we moved together to Lausanne, mm -hmm. and we decided to work on mouse memory tumor virus. So you <laughs> met in Berlin, not in the U.S.? No, no, we met in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh and then yes, and then we moved, moved together, together to Berlin. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so then in 1980, you joined the Institute for Genetics Nuclear Research Center in Karlsruhe. In, Germ in Germany as a tenured group leader. Yeah. So what was your first grant on? Well, okay, this, this is, maybe this is where I should tell you we didn't have to write grants. Uh -huh. We didn't write grants. So my first grant, I, I only ever wrote later. a grant in a, at the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel. So we were recruited and we continued working on mouse memory tumor virus because we had cloned it as we, when we moved there, we already had cloned it. We knew that it could be what was exciting about it actually was that you could put, you could transfect it into mm -hmm. exogenous cells. In those days, we did use something called L cells, mouse cells, and you could transfect it in. And that was all new technologies, but you could transfect it in. And then I added, we added uh, glucocorticoids, yeah. and we could see that you could induce it. So it said that you could um, take it, it out of its exogenous, yeah. of its normal situation, and still have the regulation mm -hmm. in when you transfect it into another cell. And uh, so that's what we did. We were doing in Karlsruhe, mm -hmm. and because it was a government, um, nicely funded government institute, we didn't have to write for grants. Okay. There was uh, quite a bit of money available yes. in those days. <laughs> but then, after this, you joined uh, the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in Bern, in Switzerland. And how was the Ludwig Institute back then? And mm -hmm. what did you work on? Did you continue on MMTV? Yeah, so we were recruited to the Ludwig Institute in Bern, um, and in and, and this case, we, so Bern was uh, recruited as director, and I was a, had a group leader position there, and they were uh, devoted to breast cancer research, so we knew something about bre human breast cancer, but not that much. And um, we knew already in those days that mouse memory tumor virus was not a, a, a very good model for human breast cancer. There didn't seem to be a retrovirus in, in human milk that would, would be the causative agent of a, a breast cancer. So we, we, we slowly, we, no, pretty rapidly switched over to studying human um, breast cancer, mainly in tissue cult with tissue culture models, mm -hmm. and then also looking for oncogenes in, um, in the DNA of primary tumors, primary breast tumors, and, and, and cell lines. So that Ludwig in, the, in those, well, it was, uh, devoted to hum it was devoted to human cancer, the entire the, the Ludwig. Ludwig groups yeah, well, working yeah. around the world were all working on human cancer and trying to combine uh, basic research with translational research, well, so-called translational research. research. They didn't call it that in those uh -huh. days, but I would say they were ahead of them, the times. They were trying to do something that we still try to do today. Today, yeah. yeah. So Nancy, who were your role models, if any, and uh, <laughs> who were your mentors? Well, so I, w I think that I learned really about how to do science with Gunther Schutz at the, at the Max Planck Institute, so my first postdoc in Berlin. Uh, Gunther was a firm believer in lots of discussions. So we everything mm -hmm. you discuss everything in those a days. Group discussion. Group discussion. I mean politics, movies, books, <laughs> science. <laughs> so we did a lot of discussing in those days, and we'd always discuss with the entire group. The group was small, maybe in the beginning, maybe six or seven people, and and so everybody was involved in one way or the other with the with the, this joint project mm -hmm. of looking at steroid hormone regulation. And so we talked together, and we always uh, get criticism, but also positive um, yeah. uh, critiques to people's work. 
So I think he, Gunther, I learned a lot. Of, I learned about the science and how to discuss it in, in Gunther's lab. So I, I guess back back then the concept of mentors didn't exist yeah, no, the way we, didn't, we, no, we no. understand it I today. I never heard the word mentor in those uh -huh. days. So we would be, well, I mean, we had these discussions. So he would guide our science, but he wasn't, he didn't really come around and ask, well, what about your future, your plans for the next five years? Because it was easier in those days to, uh, move around and get to and to get recruited after <laughs> five years at the ludwig institute for cancer research you moved to the friedrich mischer institute in basel where you are currently a senior group leader what attracted you to the fmi and to basel back then yeah so when we were working in bern we got to know um uh, first alex mater who was uh, um, he was eventually the head of oncology in Novartis, uh, but at that point he was just hired in oncology to develop uh, kinase inhibitors. And, um, and so we got to know him when we were in Ludwig Institute. And when we were looking uh, for a job after the Ludwig Institute, which unfortunately closed because of monetary difficulties in the, um, in the stock market in those days, when we were looking, um, and this was in 86 or 87, it was 87, that must so have been like a big it was drama. A, yeah, it was a it was a shock for yeah yeah, yeah. yeah because they closed um, three institutes at the same time and um, so then we contacted um, Alex, Alex to see yeah. Alex Mato to see if what, if there would be anything interesting in in uh, Basel and he put us in touch with Max Berger who was the relatively new um, director of the Friedrich Mischer Institute. Oh. And FMI was associated with Siba Geigy. So it was a research institute associated with, um, with Siba Geigy. And so Max then um, interviewed Bernd and myself and then, and then hired us as um, senior group leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, that was in, in 1988 we so moved that's there. How you moved to so that's Basel. how we ended up in Basel. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, I, yeah. and, uh, and, and I think it was actually in hindsight, while it was a difficult year when we were not didn't know whether we had what our next job would be, in hindsight it was a lot better to work there because there's certainly a lot more cancer research and because of the companies there and, and their interest in cancer research, it, I would say it's a better, it was a better environment. Mm -hmm. So it's an institute that is at uh, the interface between academia and industry. And, and, industrial, and, and industrial research, so yeah. uh, med bio we would say biomedical, biomedical research, research these yeah. days, not uh -huh. industrial. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So Alex Matter was the, the, on the head of oncology during the time of the discovery of Gleevec, right? Right, right. So they oh, were working on that when I was uh, yeah. working there too, because so Max Berger Nick said Leiden. that yeah. I, that I had to, I should be um, the link between the Friedrich Mischer Institute and and, and, and those days Siba Geigy Oncology, yeah. and so I moved my labs over to um, in, uh, over to the Siba Geigy site, okay. and so that we could have closer contact with them. So uh, so Alex was like my my boss in those days, where he provided the he provided the money for the lab and, and positions, some positions I got from Alex Matter. And so this was where, and those that, that was where I learned how, do you, how you have to think about, um, well, where you, how does your research stand? With, he, Alex asked me one time, when we were working on single chain antibody toxins, he says, well, what's the patent situation? And I had never had anybody ask me about the patent situation on any topic I was working on. So of course I went off and had a look and I realized that Genentech had a lot of good patents for the, um, uh, EGF receptor and, and ERP2 as uh, as targets in mm -hmm. cancer research. So um, yes, I don't know where we. Where yes. what, I've kind of yes. went off on that question. Yeah, well, I I, you know, I just want to like to <laughs> yeah. hear about your first yeah. years in Basel. Yeah. Okay, and the other person I should thank really is Max Berger because he he really promoted um, I would say my independency, my independent career, and and that that I should be the link. So my lab should move over to the company and and. Um, take on this challenge of linking basic research and, and um, biomedical research. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think uh, that was, uh, in hindsight, also a good good move. Yeah, so I, so uh, Max played an important role for cancer yes. research, not only in the Basel area, but also worldwide. I know yes. that he used to bring uh, cancer research scientists from all throughout the world to meetings in uh, in Massachusetts. Yes, he has a very nice house on uh, the, the airplane house in Woods Hole, and he was always willing to open it up for all for kinds brainstorming. of brainstorming meetings. So they were great meetings, and even the group leaders had the had the brainstorming session there uh -huh. uh, right before Max retired. Okay. Yeah, it was special. So Nancy, then you became mm -hmm. titular professor for molecular biology at the University of Basel. 
in 2003 so then you had to teach Oh yeah, so I but I was te I was always teaching in uh, even in Kazu I was teaching in in my position and we did and and a little bit in in Bern as well, so I enjoy teaching and uh, and in the topic particularly since the topic was uh, cancer research so one could always uh, give uh, pick out something new in the mm -hmm. field of cancer research and try to explain that to young um, mm -hmm. upcoming scientists. Are you still around the course <laughs> yes. of uh, experimental oncology right, right. at the University of Basel? Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of the few cancer, well, uh -huh. the only cancer course at the university, non-medical faculty, mm -hmm. the medical faculty has a cancer course. Yeah. yeah. So your first papers were on yeast. Then in 1977, you published the cell paper on uh, comparison of total mRNA complexity and ovalbumin, ovomucoid and lysozyme <laughs> mRNA content <laughs> in the oviduct <laughs> of laying <laughs> <in the> hands <laughs> and estradiol stimulated and withdrawal chicks. Right. That's a long title. <laughs> Can you tell us more <laughs> about these studies? It's not what you would call a catchy title these days. We would have done it differently. Yeah, so as I, I alluded to in the beginning, the oviduct was one of these few systems that you could actually get enough RNA out of. Uh, in so we wanted to have um, uh, specific RNAs. We didn't want to have a whole population of RNA. Of course, you could get that too just mm -hmm. by using oligo DT columns. But you could also, because there was, say, 50% of the RNA in the cell or more was devoted to um, egg white protein production. So if you took your, s if you had a, had a laying hen, and isolated the RNA on the polysomes. You could take you and and we and we had antibodies that in those days, so you could bring down the chicken, the o, um, ovalbumin producing polysomes, mm -hmm. and then purify the RNA. And so this is how the first cloning um, was uh, carried out. And my um, so this particular paper was was related to well, how much how much of the RNA is actually oviduct uh, mm -hmm. is um, egg white protein specific and how much oh, are these housekeeping genes making up? How much RNA are they producing? And they, in the oviduct, they produce maybe only five to 10% maximum of all the RNAs and everything is, all the energy goes into the differentiation um, and yeah. production. So yeah, so similar actually to milk yeah. and what we know about the milk too. So followed <laughs> many papers. Yeah. <laughs> so followed many papers. The first one that mentioned the mammary gland was in 1980 in the Journal of Virology. It was on number and location of mouse mammary tumor virus proviral DNA in mouse DNA of normal tissue and of mammary tumors. So followed numerous, more than 30 papers on uh, MMTV, the mouse mammary tumor virus. Can you tell us more about MMTV and how useful was this for studying mammary tumors? Yeah, so we, because of our interest in steroid hormones, we were looking, Bernd and I were looking for another model system that potentially was a little easier to work with. I mean, it didn't turn out to be that way in hindsight, but it, w it seemed easier, it seemed more straightforward. And that was the mouse mammary tumor virus because it's um, induced by the lactogenic hormones in the mammary gland of female mice. And then it's uh, set, uh, passed on to the offspring as a milk-borne virus. Uh, so this, and then these, uh, these uh, pups then get mammary cancer when they, um, get older. And so we thought, well, it'd be interesting to have it. So we knew that it was an endogenous retrovirus. Was It, it gets integrated. It's, in, I mean, an endogenous provirus mm -hmm. that, that produces these RNAs. And, and we knew that it, this 10KB of the ret, of the provirus had all of the um, um, components that were needed to uh, be responsive to uh, steroid hormones or mm -hmm. lactogenic hormones. And so we thought, we'll switch over to that one. We'll clone the um, MMTV. And then we'll have a look at the hormone responsive um, components in this LTR, which is about 1,000 kb. So much, seemed much more straightforward than working on the chicken oviduct for the rest Absolutely. of our lives. Plus, there was a lot of competition in it, like Bird O'Malley and then the chicken oviduct sure. and our former competitor, uh, I mean, former boss. So we switched systems. And, um, and on the way to cloning um, the MMTV, we, we also studied the uh, endogenous um, um, proviruses in, the, in different strains of mice. Mm -hmm. So that was that pr the first paper. That and they would develop about. mammary tumors first. Would they develop other tumors? The, some strains of mice develop leukemia, and so it depends on the background of the mouse, and some um, salivary gland tumors, okay. mm -hmm. but the majority are mammary tumors. Mm -hmm. So in 1987, 
you published a paper in nucleic acid research. The first author is Sara Cosma. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it was on the human CKRAS gene is activated by a novel mutation in codon 13 in breast carcinoma cell lines MDA and B231. Right. Although RAS is not frequently mutated in breast cancer, in human breast cancer, the MAP kinase pathway is hyperactivated in most breast cancer. Yeah. Can you tell us more about this work? Yeah, so this, this work stemmed out of our interest when we moved to, uh, well, when we moved to the Ludwig Institute and we, we started working on human cancer. So our, one of our early projects was to take uh, primer, either primary human DNA, either primary breast tumors, or cell line um, DNA, and to transfect that into, um, so we, you could either do this in, in uh, epithelial cells or in fibroblasts. And then um, to look, and then we, then we, so we did transfections of genomic DNA, and we had uh, incubators filled with plates, 100, 200 plates, and every two weeks we harvested these uh, plates, harvested the cells, and injected them into 30 nude mice, mm -hmm. and then sometimes we got tumors. So when we got tumors, then we isolated out, back out the DNA from the, from the tumors, cloned it in those days you use alu sequences yeah. or human alu sequences to get out you sequence your your sequence and then we and then we sequenced it and we found out we had a ras mutation and that and they wasn't that was the first time that was actually the first ras mutation that was discovered in a in a breast cancer and we worked together with uh, Hans Boss to do mm -hmm. the sequencing on that because he had a an, he he was working on on ras um, on, um, ras genes and and, and mutant ras genes and he had developed a way to sequence uh, more rapidly so we could sort out which was the um, what was the codon mm -hmm. that was actually mutated and I have to say I was always a bit embarrassed about talking about that paper because people said oh but there aren't any RAS mutations in in uh, human breast cancer and and then you start to think well maybe is it really a human breast cancer uh, mm -hmm. and we thought maybe we had the wrong kind we had made a mistake along the way but it's it's true they're not they're very rare but there there's maybe sure, only five percent but it really is a <laughs> it was the first ras oncogene yes. so the mda mb231 cell line <coughs> is widely used and is one of the rare breast cancer metastatic cell lines how do you explain the scarcity actually of metastatic models yeah. of breast cancer <coughs> yeah i was thinking i thought about that and i I think it's because we were when we first started working on breast cancer when, when people were working on breast cancer in the um, <coughs> say the late 80s or the, well and even the 70s and the 80s we were the people worked with human ER positive models because there were many more of them uh, ER positive breast cancer cell lines there's many more of them um, and as you know 80% of the primary tumors are ER positive and and of course the tamoxifen went in when, and when it was used, first used in the clinics in the mid 70s so there was a lot of interest in estrogen receptor and we know now that there aren't any there aren't any ER positive breast cancer cell lines that metastasis in fact there aren't so many ER positive mm -hmm. breast cancer cell lines anyway and they they there maybe three or four and they reflect them um, I would say the, the, differ the more differentiation, mm -hmm. uh, differentiated types of cell lines, and they don't metastasize when you put them into uh, into, into the mammary fat yeah. pad into mm -hmm. in the animals, and so the other uh, models were not it's used as often. I would say when I think back, yeah. So in 1988, you published on correlation of. CRBB2 gene amplification and protein expression in human breast carcinoma with nodal status and nuclear grading. It was published in Cancer Research. Then you published many papers <coughs> on this important human oncogene, the HER2 oncogene. So you, deline you delineated many of the signaling pathways that change downstream of uh, HER2 o amplification or overexpression. So when did you start working on RBB2? And can you tell us more about your yeah. work on HER2 over yes. the last so few this, years? Yeah, so what, as I said, when we moved to the Ludwig Institute, we wanted to work on with human material. And so we got um, 40 or 50 primary breast tumors together. And we were taking all of the known oncogene probes that came out of um, retroviruses really so you had uh, the ras probe the egf receptor probe the thyroid hormone or b or b mm -hmm. so sark all these uh, known um, probes 
and and then uh, doing running southern blood analysis and looking for amplification or rearrangement with these particular um, mm -hmm. oncogenes and and we didn't we didn't find anything with the set that we had in the lab maybe 15 or so and then I went to a uh, uh, oncogene meeting in the states at Hood College must have been right after we started at the Ludwig Institute and I heard um, Yamamoto describe a new EGF rece receptor related um, gene so he got it out of uh, human material and this was the what he called the ERB2 ERB1 was EGF receptor so this was ERB2 and so I thought well if EGF receptor wasn't amplified but we didn't find it, so maybe the ERB2 will be amplified. And so we, Seriously. this was one of those uh, exciting times when you develop a, a blood and you see, my God, it was, it is amplified. Wow. And there were at least probably, we had a lot in this particular panel. We probably had out of the 30, hello, we had 10, I think, that had, the, had this amplification. And so then I teamed up with uh, Alan Goldhurst. She was working at the Ludwig uh, Institute in those days, a f um, pretty famous clinician. I mean, he's very famous now, but he was famous in those days too. And uh, he then, um, we had a look then at the at this parameters that we could get a hold of with this panel of uh, mm, breast clinical tumors, parameters, the clinical yeah. parameters. And we could see um, that, well, yeah, so that we had some correlation then with the worst. But you uh, also generated an antibody against her too. Yeah, right? so the antibody, w w well, first it w the first antibodies were generated with Mike Waterfield. And so we collaborated with Mike Waterfield and, and brought somebody came down from his, um, Bill Gullick came down from the Waterfield lab. And, and together we had a look then at whether or not the protein was overexpressed. Because of course, if you have an ampicon, it doesn't sure. mean the protein is overexpressed. And so we were also we're using these antibodies we could show. We were the first to show that you also had overexpression of the of the protein, and that's a very a paper I'm very proud of that uh, cancer research paper. So then you worked a lot on signaling downstream of HER2. Right. Yeah. So after that, then we started doing everything imaginable with the well. There was no ligand in those days for ERB2, but so one could look at um, uh, the other ligands. I mean, we also we also um, well we, we the first thing we did was make antibodies. So we wanted to know whether we could target the block. A block, um, at so it, because in the mid 80s, they had Mendelssohn had shown that with an EGF receptor blocking antibody, you could have an impact on, on tumor cell growth mm -hmm. and in vivo and in vitro. So we thought we'll make a panel of antibodies for the ERB2 and see if we can also block um, uh, tumor growth with our antibodies or have an impact on tumor growth. And we also then decided to take the antibody and um, clone it, make a single chain um, antibody out of it, and attach it to a toxin. And that then was really successful in killing wow. in vivo tumor cells in in vivo tumors. And this is in the this late 80s. That was when we moved to that we did in the at, um, at FMI, at FMI already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so HER2 signaling is still a very important topic of research. And as I mentioned, you published many papers in this area. What do you think are the most exciting questions that need to be answered? in this area of research. Yeah, and the whole, I mean, there's still a lot that isn't known about how, what's the difference between the, the amplification when ERB2 is amplified. This, I mean, the structure is known to be different versus ERB2 in a ligand activated he heterodimer. And um, so the signaling potential is different between the ampli ampli amplified unit versus the ligand activated unit. This, w this, we, this we know, but I think the, I personally think the most exciting information is still what you can get out of the clinical, clinical trials. So what, mm -hmm. what are the factors that make a patient responsive to the, um, um, well, the antibody now trastuzumab? Yeah. Um, what are the resistance factors? Um, and why does er, why does this trastuzumab work relatively well with uh, chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. So it acts as a chemosensitizer, and since it has an impact on on there's less metastasis, so that must mean that it's having a well, it has an impact es essentially on this on the cancer stem cell, but it seems to work best with uh, chemotherapy. Maybe it's related to the effect on the immune system. And and well harnessing yes, the yes, immune yes. reaction against uh, well that, the cancer cells. That that's true, but this uh, that I don't know if that explains the chemotherapy. It could. Or maybe it chemotherapy could. may expose antigens yes, that make the re immune be, reaction even yeah. even stronger. But this is what I think. W I mean, this is what personally what I think is the most exciting things to do. So why does it have an impact on, for example, me metastasis? Why mm -hmm. does it prevent metastasis? So there we need we would need. Um, 
Well, you need more, you need more models for that too. Mm -hmm. to have a look at that, I think. So we also published on many other tyrosine kinases. Was this just a natural follow-up on HER2 studies? Yeah, I think Didn't I you have we enough with all <laughs> about HER2? You no, we decided well. because there's only 20% of the patients that have the HER2 sure. amplicon, and so and there's plenty of other receptors. So we thought, well, it's not. It would be interesting to expand, and uh, we did. We did a lot of work with the FGF receptors um, w that are also amplified in a certain smaller percentage of, of breast cancer. There, I would say. The, uh, well, and then I think what, what I like, the project that is my, my most uh, favorite right now is the RET receptor, because mm -hmm. really, together with Heidi Lane, uh, who was working in Novartis, so so we well, this is the RET receptor. RET we, receptor. We, yeah, uh -huh. we discovered that it's um, overexpressed at the RNA and the protein level, not due to gene amplification, mm -hmm. but in a reasonable percentage, 40, 50 percent of primary breast tumors. So we're, dis we're working on the RET receptor now, very mysterious what yeah. it's doing. Uh -huh. Um, and what its normal role in mammary gland, and and um, and and then in targeting it in cancer, yeah. in breast cancer, and developing models. Uh, yes, right. Of we have right. We are actually. So <laughs> you worked on the growth and differentiation of the HC11 mammary epithelial cells. These cells are widely used in the mammary gland development yes. and breast cancer mm -hmm. field. Can you tell us more about these cells? Yeah, so these cells actually came from uh, Dan Medina's Coma, Coma D, and this was, um, we had a, a very, in, uh, a group leader at the, in this, it was a Ludwig Institute actually in Bern, this was Roland Ball, and he decided, he knew a lot about immunology, and we had an antibody to casein, mm -hmm. so he decided to screen uh, clones of uh, the Coma 1D cells for those that were producing the highest amount of uh, casein that he saw. He sc and, the, and the HC probably, w well, it was a high casein num clone number 11. So that's how he, he got mm -hmm. this uh, That's HC how you got to this Yeah, and yeah. so he, he actually isolated them first, and then we, we started using them as models. And um, we actually, yeah, so as models to study differentiation. Mm -hmm. And the, for example, we can study RET receptor in them too, because sure, it absolutely. also gets upregulated. But you also worked on additional uh, RTKs and tyrosine kinases in general, right? But then you studied transcriptional factors. You studied STAT5. We were working on STAT5, right? right. Yeah. So Bernd Lothar and, uh, you know, Bernd uh, Groner, husband. Lothar, <laughs> your husband, <laughs> Lothar Hanihausen and Jeff Rosen all told me about the story of STAT5. Yeah. What do you recall <laughs> so from the <laughs> discovery of this important uh, transcription factor? I recall Bernd talking about bringing sheep, <laughs> sheep <laughs> memory glands back from the farm and uh, outside of Lausanne uh, in, uh, in a bucket in, the car, in our car <laughs> in order to be able to isolate enough, uh, to have enough material to isolate the STAT5. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so of course we talked about the difficulties of getting the material, and but I wasn't really involved with the um, working uh, on this isolation. This was uh, Hir Hiroshi Wakao yeah, and uh -huh. his lab who did a lot about that on, on that, and we were more interested in um, so well whether it was involved in human cancer sure. and um, how it got. Well, how it got activated, yeah. So we did some. We so we actually just uh, went, moved on from his cloning and really these first descriptions of it. So that, that they did so much just to have a closer look at um, that the phosphorylation sites in Sat5. So you can also it's also um, serine threonine mm -hmm. phosphorylated, and we were looking at that in the HD11 cells and I think in some other models too. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so Nancy, then you discovered Memo. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about <laughs> this, uh, this mysterious is, this is yet very interesting protein? Yeah. How so did you get there? Yeah, so we were looking for proteins that bound to ERB2 and were important for m uh, migration because we were interested in metastasis, migration and metastasis. And we got a number of proteins that interacted with the, with the activated receptors, so meaning the active, the phosphotyrosine um, peptides that were part of the activated receptor. And but w and one of these showed up twice in our in our mass spec screen. So this is a protein that was a, had a domain of unknown function. So this always gets the juices up in a in a in someone who likes to discover new things. Absolutely. <laughs> it turned out to be a difficult nut to crack. <laughs> Very challenging because it's expressed in um, small protein. We know it's a, now it's a oxidase, so it's a copper binding oxidase, expressed in bacteria, expressed all the way through in every kingdom of life. 
but nothing known about it in any kingdom of life. And so we're the fr we ha we're the ones who are now working on this, um, what it's doing. And mm -hmm. we know it's absolutely needed for metastasis, but it also has an important role in development. So the embryos are, um, they die um, of vascular problems. Uh, so uh, mid, mid gestation, so it's important in development. It, if you knock it out in, a, in an adult mouse, there's a premature aging syndrome, so it's certainly important in many um, different organs, but mm -hmm. difficult to connect the, its oxidase activity and, and ROS regulation to all of these uh, phenotypes. So Nancy, phenotypes, yeah. you, you published more than 215 research papers. We'll unfortunately not be able to discuss all the topics and major discoveries from your lab. I'd like that we talk a bit about your interest in uh, metastasis. Yeah, so why? I mean, yes, for me why? it's obvious to work on metastasis because this is what kills uh, breast cancer patients. You can remove the primary tumor and, and what's killing the, what kills the females um, are, is the, are the metastasis that can come up 15, even 15 year, 10, 15 years later can, can appear and, and then kill a patient because we don't have any cures for metastatic breast cancer. And so this is the, this is the challenge in breast cancer, of course, in other cancers as well. But I think it's so, because breast cancer is so common and many women, of course, do survive beyond five years, so beyond the maybe mm -hmm. treatment with chemo or, or even endocrine agent therapy but then succumb to their disease seven, eight years later. Or, um, and so what, how, can, how, do, how can we come up with new uh, um, therapies for metastasis? Mm -hmm. So this is why, why, why I'm interested in metastasis. So with all the exciting discoveries and our understanding of cancer, I think we are living in the golden age of cancer research. What is your vision of translational cancer research, so-called valley of death? Yeah, <laughs> so how you get from a, of a genetic alteration to a drug that actually works. And um, I mean, having worked on Herceptin or Trastuzumab Herceptin, and this actually does work, and it's, pr it's when given in combination with chemotherapy. So this is an example of a, of a, how a well-run trial mm -hmm. where the right patients were picked out right in the beginning, and sure. they see the right biomarker, the right biomarker, which was the Ampicon, yes. essentially, or in the, and the overexpressed uh, uh, protein. And and the tri and, and the antibody is is great. The Herceptin really really works. I mean, it doesn't cure metastatic breast cancer, but it, but it even did have an impact on um, disease progression. And when given in those patients, and when it's given, that, then the the newer trials then said, given in combination with um, chemotherapy, you maybe only need to give trastuzumab for a year. So it says that you're really hitting the stem cells. So what mm -hmm. we what we need to know, I mean, what the hardest part of translational research is, is understanding the times, the cases that work. Mm -hmm. So the cases like testicular cancer, where you can sure. cure with cisplatin. So why does that work so, so well? And why doesn't it kill, uh, cisplatin kill other types of tumors as well? Mm -hmm. um, um, so it has so to do with the stem cells. So we need to understand the pathophysiology of this disease right, right, better. Right, And so just just sequencing, of course, it's important if your patient comes in and, uh, and it's going to be common now that the patient's genome will be sequenced. And if you have a, if you c if you see that the patient has a say EGF receptor mutation in lung cancer, then of course they get a kinase inhibitor. Um, but it doesn't mean that every not every patient res will respond to that um, treatment. And even if they do respond, we get you get relapses. And so what 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 w it would be nice to know up front whether or not the patient is going to respond to the kinase inhibitor and what other combination would be best to give to that pa pa patient. So be it a, a chemotherapy or maybe another targeted inhibitor. But can we get that information out of the primary, what we know about the primary tumor DNA? Mm -hmm. That I think is, a, is the challenge in the next 10 years. How to use the drugs that we have better mm -hmm. because we won't be able to just we won't never have uh, enough money to treat all of the with all these new inhibitors that sure. are coming along to treat every patient with them. So yeah, you know, selective. the example of Herceptin is example of success story, and example of Gleevec and others. There are other success stories f going from basic research to to uh, to the clinic and to patients. So this is translational research how do you think we can increase you know like more of uh, the success stories in terms of 
translation and research because the way still it, we do research in many labs we have research labs separated from the clinic and clinicians treating the patients separated from the research yeah so I mean uh, it's clear that you have you have to have these sa cancer centers where you the clinicians talk to the basic researchers and that, that ba people who are interested in basic research understand maybe what the most important clinical questions are and, and if they're working in the cancer hospital, of course, then they should be interested in trying to get their work devoted to these important questions. Uh, that they work, just like I talked about metastasis, I mean, that's the, that's the important sure. thing to be working on now, but how can we do that? How can we, we don't have good animal models for metastasis. I mean, human so we metastasis need to develop come important 10 models. years later. Can you even study that in a, in a mouse model? It's hard. Mm -hmm. So Nancy, you mentored many postdocs and also students from all around the world. Some of them are professors, others group leaders or group heads in industry, others are editors of top journals. How important was this to you? Oh, to see the success. I, I mean, this was really important. You and to want, train them or uh, mentor them. Well, to, I mean, this was, of course, a lot of not only fun. I mean, sometimes at the end it was fun when they finished and they sure. had a successful paper. Sometimes it was difficult, but it, but um, I'm happy that most of the people who left my lab they actually stayed in science, so mm -hmm. they were uh, they, that That's I somehow rewarding. could and and uh, make them enthusiastic. They mm -hmm. wanted to do uh, stay in science, and um, and that that yeah that there are many of them are are quite successful. I would say that's rewarding. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Um, yeah. So it's always fun to work with young people and to watch them develop, uh -huh. I would say, over the years. Yeah. So Nancy, what would you advise a junior faculty who is going to start her or his uh, team to work on breast cancer? Yeah. Well, the metastasis is what you've got to be working on, but it's a hard one. So then you've got to take a step back and say, what can I do where I can have some, some uh, relatively rapid results because mm -hmm. otherwise I won't get my <laughs> get my tenure position mm -hmm. uh, and and there I think I mean it's clear it's a stem you have to work on stem cells and the, the or the tumor initiating cells in the, in breast cancer I think we still need to to know a lot about about them mm -hmm. and there are good there are models that one can study that in vivo and in vitro so I think that that's probably what I would tell them tumor initiating cells in the, in the context of a niche so either the bone niche or the lung niche. Um, mm -hmm. So looking at metastasis in the, these types of so places. Yeah. So you know, you know a lot about cancer research in the United States and also about cancer research in Europe. I know you are in, involved in many commissions. So what are the major differences and what would you advise a Euro European policy maker in a, to advance cancer research yes. in Europe? So I think that would be more. It would be important to have more cancer centers that are there. Been there, there are men, there are more of them in the United States. Of course, U.S. is bigger, of course. But that where where you have where you do have the opportunity to have the clinicians. You have a hospital. You have the clinicians, and these clinicians can have time off to do work at the bench or to run a research lab, and they interact with um, scientists basic who scientists. are basic scientists who are interested in in clinical clinically relevant questions. And and this is, um, I think, when you see what the medics have to do here when they're working in the hospital, they don't have much time to go off and do um, research. So we had some at the Ludwig Institute. We did have some oncologists who worked together with us, but they would constantly be getting a buzz, and they had to go off to a patient, and somebody ha had to help had to finish the experiment. So they they were torn between their patients and the and the bench. They didn't have enough time to do both. But the idea is to create I centers in which the two of them can interact. Yes, and, and that, this, that the clinicians have more free time uh, to free up some time for their, their, for research. For their own research. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Nancy, what are the major questions that you think still need to be answered in the fields of breast development and breast cancer? And what are the major challenges facing us? Yeah. As communities. Well, I mean, what I mean, the major challenge is still prevention. I mean, what do we? How could we prevent? Can we prevent breast cancer? We mm -hmm. people talk a lot about diet. Doesn't 
it's hard to pinpoint the the diet down or lifestyle what what could one do to maybe have a more of an impact on prevention like stopping smoking has a had impact a major on impact lung on lung cancer so w is there any way that we could have um have an impact on, pre on uh, at the prevention level i think this is because it is so common that we w you do want to be able to see if you could influence uh, the getting can the sure. cancer to begin with so preventing it um so while well, the metastasis still <laughs> remains a challenge, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. it's, um, and so this would be one. Well, I think that yeah. I mean, and do, do if you knew that, I mean, how you can get people who or women who, if they would take tamoxifen or endocrine agents, and it's of course known to be to help uh, to prevent breast cancer, but how you get the message across to the general public that taking something for preventing be breast cancer, I mean. A, a medication that mm -hmm. also has side effects. I think these are challenges. So Nancy, what would you like to tell the next generation of <laughs> scientists <laughs> yeah. who will watch this <laughs> video? Yeah. Well, if you're yeah, if you like, if you're curious and you and you like to discover new things, I mean, it's a great job. It keeps you, keeps you. Um, people always say, "What are your hobbies?" And I say, "Well, actually, uh, my hobby is my science. My job, <laughs> my, my job, job is my, my passion. My job <laughs> is my passion." So, I mean, if and if you if you don't feel that way about it, then you, that's that would I would say don't <laughs> get into it because uh -huh. you have so many. There are a lot of setbacks along the way, and so you have to be totally enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah, so that I would say it's you've got to have this driven. You've got to be driven to do science. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's any. Is there any? Is hungry. there any question <laughs> that I should have <laughs> asked, but I yeah. didn't? Oh, I, th I think this idea of what was the most exciting gel or whatever that you had, <laughs> uh -huh. the most exciting, re some of the most exciting results. Mm -hmm. and because I still remember, um, and we talked about the, the Herb 2 but I still remember when we did this cloning of the um, LTR, so the MMTV mm -hmm. LTR, and people didn't know that you could take this LTR out of a cell and transfect it into another cell and then that it would work. And I still remember standing there on the counter, because in those days you did everything with tritium, and seeing that these cells that I transfected um, did respond to steroid hormones. So I still can see myself standing in the counter room with a strip of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think it's, uh, it's nice it's to think about the most exciting mm -hmm. <laughs> result that you had in your career. There are a few, few times where mm. I, I would, yeah, so that's what I would add. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Nancy. It was a pleasure uh, discussing with you. Yeah, Momo. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, okay. nice.